made his weekend in 1990. Um, <clears throat> I was three. <laughs> his topic is the essence and purpose of Curcio. Go ahead. Okay. Um, normally, I'd say the uh, prayer to the Holy Spirit beginning my royal, but we've already we've already done that. So, um, so we'll just move on. Uh, I think to begin this royal on the essence and purpose of Curcio, we must come to the table with an understanding and acceptance that being Christian means believing that Christ calls us and loves us. Not only that, though, but Christ also calls us to love others as he loves us. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, love one another as I have loved you. Now, we're called as Christians to love one another, not as one person loves another, but as God loves us. Perfect, true, and unending love. That's a tall order. I'm fairly sure that the kind of love we're talking about here, I have perhaps been able to give to just a few people in my life. My wife, Martha, my children, my close family, my grandchildren. But can any of us say that we love everyone we come in contact with in the same way that God loves us? Of course not. But we're called to try. And in trying to reach that perfect love, we are trying to be like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is God. And God is love. So thus, the essence of the church is Jesus Christ. The church is not dogma or doctrine or ritual, not an essence. In essence, it is Jesus. In essence, it is love. The book, The Study of Charism, tells us on page 81, by essence, we mean the permanence and invariability of things, what something is, what is necessary, indispensable, the crux of things. Circumstances can change regarding something, but the identity of the inner core, the essence, always remains. The essence of a thing is unchangeable. So if Concio is a movement of the church, which it is, and if the essence of the church is Jesus Christ, which it is, then the essence of the Curcio and Christianity movement is also, therefore, Jesus Christ. That is, the essence of Curcio and Christianity is based on its charism of being the good news of God's love. It is proclaiming through my actions that God loves me and he loves everyone. Now, this is an earth shattering revelation, but it's not a new one. God has always showed his love for all people. In the Old Testament, his love appears from the time of creation, Eve for Adam, the rainbow for Noah and his family, the parting of the Red Sea, the manna in the desert, the Ten Commandments for the Israelites. Of course, this love also occurs in the New Testament. A new commandment I give unto you, love one another as I have loved you. Now, I could take a lot of time here giving you examples from the New Testament referring to God, and of course, Jesus is love. But the simple fact that you're here and are active in this movement testifies that you are aware of this fact. And yet, there's millions of people out there who are not aware of this one simple fact, this one endearing truth, this one supremely important bit of knowledge, that God loves them. How is it possible that they don't know? 20 centuries have passed with this knowledge in our hands. 2,000 years of not only knowing that God loves us, but in knowing that we are called to proclaim this to each and every living person. Knowing that no one who is living now or who has ever lived should die or have died without knowing the simple truth that God loves them. So how has it happened that in 2,000 years, this knowledge has not been given to every single living human being? What have we as the church been doing wrong? Well, perhaps Christians have been more concerned with Christianity than with being Christian. All our attention has been placed on the external acts of faith, on Christ's passion and sacrifice more than his essence, his essential, his love. Emphasis was placed on the humiliation and repentance of the prodigal son 
instead of on the love of the good father. Now, this direction was given to us by the church, a church which, if we're to be honest, became misdirected many times in its history. That's not surprising, nor should it bother us. The biggest mistake any of us can make about our church is to expect it to be perfect. Like any organization, as long as the church is made up of people, it will never be perfect. Yet after 2,000 years, you would think something would change, and it did. The Holy Spirit chose to cause a revival, not from the halls of the Vatican, not even from the ranks of the clergy. The Holy Spirit chose to revive the laity from where things obviously needed to be different. It was perceived once more that the message is God's love. Thus arises the charism of Curcio, a gift given and shared for the good of the church. The Holy Spirit would have sent a wave of hope upon the world. And therefore, the essence of the Curcio is the reality of love, the reality of friendship, the reality that Christ is my friend, and the good news that God in Christ loves me. If this is the essence of Curcio, what then is its purpose? Well, really, the purpose is not a what, it's a who, because the purpose of the charism of Curcio is directed to the person. And Curcio is directed to the person so that all women and men of the world will know the good news that God in Christ loves me. The book Fundamental Ideas 3 tell us in paragraph 96, this means that the intention of the Curcio movement is to bring the good news of God's love to every person, especially to those who are far away since the experience of the love of God is the basic element in living what is fundamental to being Christian. The far away are those who do not have faith or do not know if they have it because their lives have been caught up in things they believe are important, but that do not satisfy them. The far away are those people who do not know that God loves them. They have maybe never been told about the good news where they have been told about Christ's passion and sacrifice, but not about the fact that God loves them, or they have not really absorbed the message. They are far away because nobody told them that God loves them, or because they did not want to listen, or because what reached them was not in the language and style appropriate for them. As a result, these men and women either have no faith or do not know if they have faith, or do not want to have faith. These people live in their environments and do not ever know that God loves them because they do not have ears to hear, or do not understand what they hear, or simply do not want to hear. They do not participate in parish activities or live the sacraments. They spiritually vegetate. The purpose of Curcio is to give the good news to these people. The way we give them the good news is to go on planting the seed and spreading the hunger for God in the world. Keep in mind that the purpose of Curcio is to create the hunger, not to feed it. The far away can learn the good news and know that God loves them. But the last 2,000 years have shown us that only a few will do so on their own. What is needed is someone to get to know the far away and tell them. Following this talk on a CDC back in the day when we were actually able to meet in person, uh, someone came to me and shared that this all sounds well and good, but it doesn't consider the fact that in this day and age, we all live busy, complicated lives. I don't have time to go out and preach the good news. Well, life does get complicated, but it should not get in the way of our spreading the good news. Getting through the complications of life is our way to spread the good news. It is how I act with these complications in my dealings with others that show my awareness that God loves me. The purpose of Curcio is designed to uplift ordinary life, not life once all the complications have been taken away. I need to proclaim the good news when I'm stuck at the auto mechanic or when a student ignores instructions for a chem lab I've given, even though I've explained it three times. Or when the wife insists that I'm wrong, even though I'm certain I'm right. 
Well, that happens, not often, but it happens. The point is, we must proclaim the good news in all the messiness of life. We can't wait for the perfect time. This uplifting, as far as Perseo is concerned, involves three phases, the who, the how, and the for whom. The who is who should do the uplifting, and that means all of us. The how is one simple method, friendship. The for whom is the question of who is uplifted, which are those we encounter in our ordinary life. Ordinary life, the target of the uplifting has a very specific who and where. Of course, all people should know that God loves them. All people enjoy the love of God, whether they know it or not. But the attention of the charism of Curcio is directed in particular to the far away, to those who are far away from the Lord. We need to be clear that when we speak of the far away, we're not speaking of those that are far away from us. On the contrary, we are speaking of those who are close to us, as close as that one square meter in our personal environments. The far away are the doubting Thomases among us. In today's gospel, Jesus did not allow Thomas to remain in doubt. Instead, he came to Thomas in friendship and invited him to touch his wounds. We must invite our friends who are far away to come to know Jesus almost as intimately as Jesus invited Thomas to do. And perhaps through that invitation, they will actually come to know Jesus more intimately than Thomas did in that upper room. These far away friends are the people to whom we are called to spread the good news that God loves them. Therefore, the primary purpose of Curcio is to create a world of friends where we find them. This means to create a world of friends in our own environments. Now, unfortunately, when we think of environments, we tend to think in terms of places. That, however, would be a poor understanding of what Curcio means by environment. What we must understand environment to mean is much more than just the place where a gathering occurs. The environment actually is a result of people gathering together, a result of their interactions. We need to think not in terms of where a person works or plays, but more about the interaction of the people he works and plays with. That would be a truer concept of environment. To uplift, that is to leaven the environments, we must reach the point where our one square meter comes into contact, our homes, our schools, our supermarket, the office, the mall, the stores, the beach, the taxi, the airplane, all the places we occupy in our daily lives. Women and men who through Curcio have had an awakening of hunger for God should be returned to their own environments. They should not be removed from an environment in which they find themselves to be taken to work in a different environment, no matter how good this different environment may be. This is not what Curcio is for. Women and men who have understood the simplicity of the message that Christ loves them should remain in their same environment, growing Christianity by means of old friendships and new friendships with, with those whom they live, work, and play with their family, their co-workers, the people they spend leisure activities with. These are people and places where perhaps no one else, not the clergy, not other, other friends, no one else will reach. So if we want to put a fine point to this, the purpose of Curcio's and Christianity movement is to build up Christianity by communicating to our world of friends in our natural environments. When speaking to a gathering of Curcistas, St. Pope John Paul II succinctly expressed the purpose of Curcio. He said, your movement asks of you to be leavened in the dough of the world. All men and women, but especially the far away, need someone to go to their environments to tell them that God loves them, because that is the only way they will learn it. They're not going to learn it on their own, and they are not going to seek it out by going to church. The far away will listen to someone who goes to tell them, but only if the messenger acts in friendship, and only if that friend acts without egotism, acts without judgment, and acts with a fullness of love. 
The far away need to be loved by us as God loves them. We must allow them just as they are. We must, I'm sorry, we must love them just as they are, not as we wish they were. The far away will come to see and understand that what they really want is happiness with the life of Christ. If, and only if though, they see us, their friends, living it out in the complications of our, of our lives. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus commissioned the 72. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you like lambs among the wolves. If we understand the clergy to be the successors of the 12 apostles, then as laity, are we not the successors of those 72? And as John tells us in chapter 13, verse 35, this is how all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The bottom line is that to live the purpose of Perseo, we must spread our knowledge, give our witness, and share our experience of what is fundamental to being Christian in our personal environments during our ordinary life as we live it each day. We should reach out to people in friendship so that they might encounter Christ. Our only motivation should be to let them know that God loves them. The expression is make a friend, be a friend, and bring that friend to Christ. It says nothing about bringing that friend to Crucio. Our friendship and proclamation of the good news must be honest and sincere. This is the only way that those who are far away will accept us. We should make our friends among people that we find in the movable square meter in which the Lord has placed us. If we all did this and did it well, then everyone, especially those far away, will learn that God loves them. And that is truly the good news. Take Loris.